Hello, my name is Dimitri. A couple months ago, I had a sighting that I was able to record in the video. Uh, it's just a small uh, white orb uh, slowly passing in the sky. Uh, they're moving relatively slow. Uh, you can see white glow, and you can when one of them went through the cloud, you can see clouds illuminated too. So that's why I was a little bit suspicious. I uh, didn't know exactly what it was because couldn't think of anything that would illuminate class. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Area 52. Today we'll be deep diving into and reading the entire EBO file that was posted on Reddit, I believe a year ago. Now, if you're wondering what an EBO is, all will be explained in due time, but the headline reads as follows. From the late 2000s to the mid 2010s, I worked as a molecular biologist for a national security contractor in a program to study exobiospheric organisms, EBOs. I will share with you a lot of information on this subject. Feel free to ask questions or ask for clarification. You still might not be sure what an EBO is. Sounds exotic. Well, that's because an EBO is actually a gray alien, folks. And today we're going to be diving into... Uh, for lack of a better term, Grey's Anatomy. All right, I'm here all week. Makes me wonder if they came up with that show to cover this file up, which came out years later. Time travel. I don't know. It's early, okay? Don't judge me. Folks, it is my pleasure to read these, by the way. I do really enjoy making these videos. But one thing that does help us out here and helps to ensure quality, quantity, continuity, consistency is... Patreon, and YouTube memberships. Whether you subscribe to Patreon or YouTube memberships by clicking the join button below, you instantly have access to our entire hidden library, which includes uncut interviews from past investigations, weekly vlogs, which I put together to show you the behind the scenes of what we're working on next on Area 52, as well as access to our top secret section of our Discord, which includes a book club, movie nights, Q and A's and so much more. It's five dollars a month, but it goes a long way to help this channel, and we do appreciate it here. All right, we're done paying the bills, folks. Now, normally I would do like a patch review right before one of these. I didn't have time this week because I'm currently editing the next investigation, and the you know the interns over at Area 52 know what I'm working on right now. But it is heavy, and it's a lot of edits. So we're gonna skip the patch review, and we're gonna get right into the meat of it. Like this video, subscribe, hit the notification bell. Let's go. So this is posted a year ago to slash aliens, all right, which is a subreddit. Take all of this information in with a grain of salt. Obviously, I don't need to be the one telling you this. We read through the 4chan leak or 4chan q and I'm going to read it as though it's real. I'm going to react to it as though it's real because we do like thought experiments here. But that does not mean that I believe everything I read and nor should you. It starts off as follows. From the late 2000s to the mid 2010s, I worked as a molecular biologist for a national security contractor in a program to study exobiospheric organisms. The aim of the program was to elucidate the genome and proteome basis of these organisms. Small disclaimer, because this person was a molecular biologist, they will be using some jargon and terminology that I may not be familiar with and that you may not be familiar with at home. If you are familiar with some of this uh, language, I do highly encourage you to leave a comment and to help us along the way to understand what he's saying. Although the study of OBCs all right, we're going to we're going to go ahead and Google OBCs right away. And by Google, I mean ChatGPT. Uh, specific genes, proteins or experimental terms used in particular organisms or research settings. It could also be shorthand for a gene or protein related to replication or binding activities. OK, we'll keep this not too far because I, I do believe we'll we'll uh, make use of it. Although the study of OBC has been going on for decades in other programs, the new high throughput DNA sequencing technologies of the late 90s unblocked stagnant research in this area. Since then, several breakthroughs have led to significant advances in our understanding of the genome and proteome of these beings. What we've learned so far has enabled us to outline some disconcerting perspectives about our place in the universe. Briefly, we've discovered that the EBO genome is a chimera of genomes from our biosphere and from an unknown one. 
They are artificial, ephemeral, and disposable organisms created for a purpose that still partially eludes us. I'll be substantiating my statements after a brief introduction. Folks, this guy is saying, well, I don't even know if it's a guy actually. This person is saying that these biological organisms that he's been testing seem to be artificial, ephemeral, and disposable organisms. This is also the feeling that I got when reading through, you know, the 4chan Q&A was that not only were the craft built to spec, but I had a feeling that these entities were built to spec as well. And if we look back at Bob Lazar's famous blue documents that he read through, it mentions, and this is something that haunts many ufologists and people who study the UFO phenomenon, it mentions containers, that we humans are containers and that these greys refer to us as containers. Now, why would something refer to us as containers? And containers of what? No, some have speculated that we are containers of souls, that this body is created almost entirely to attract, you know, a certain high level of consciousness that flows through a body, which we call a soul. But that would mean the greys don't have one. In this context, that would make sense if they're artificial, ephemeral, and disposable, like they're soulless AI biological drones. Worker bees. It gets more interesting, folks. If you find any connections, by the way, I would love to hear them. Leave them in the comments below, or better yet, um, join the Discord. Leave it there. Discord's free. There is a top secret section that you can have access to, yes, but there's a whole free section. If you guys want to, you know, add to the conversation, that's a good place to do it as well. But comments are always welcome. I do check the comments. I digress. The reason for disclosing these secrets is quite simple. I believe that every human being has the right to know the truth and that to progress, humanity needs to divest itself of certain institutions and organizations that will probably not survive these revelations in the long term. I'm aware that I'll have a very little impact in this regard, but I still believe that small leaks are necessary to break the dam of misinformation on this subject. When the governments will eventually reveal these secrets, there will undoubtedly be a societal upheaval, but in my opinion, the longer we wait, the worse it will be. I choose to divulge what I know anonymously out of selfishness for the well-being of myself and my family. I'm aware that this diminishes the reach and credibility of my message, but it's the furthest I am willing to go. I chose this forum because it offers a good compromise between anonymity and popularity. In order to protect my anonymity, I will be purposely vague or even contradictory about any information that could identify me, date, education, role, etc. I'll even introduce red herrings in this respect. I want to make it clear that any information related to the subject of the research will not be treated in this way. Very, very important disclaimer, folks. He did say that he's going to introduce red herrings. Now, for those who aren't aware what a red herring is, it's something to throw you off the scent. I do believe that that's actually what red herrings were used for. You know, if a dog's chasing you, you take a red herring, you throw it that way, the dog's going to go towards the fish smell, right? But he does make a note of saying that no red herrings will be used in relation to the subject of research. Anytime he mentions anything outside of the research, we can't necessarily take it at face value. Remember that. Put a pin in that, okay? But aside from that, it's fair game, apparently. Before going any further, please excuse me if you find it difficult to understand what I'm explaining. Some parts of my text are very technical. It's difficult to find the right balance between vulgarization and scientific explanation. I'll continue by talking about myself. What's the point of talking about me, knowing that the information will necessarily be misleading? I simply want to introduce a perspective on the type of people who work there. Normal scientists. I have a PhD in molecular biology. I didn't actively seek to be part of this program. Rather, it was a stroke of luck that introduced me to one of the senior scientists. I met this person at a conference where I was presenting a poster on my PhD research. When I think back, I don't believe he was impressed by what I was presenting, because it was, quite frankly, a project that wasn't going anywhere. I think it was rather the most important aspect of a professional life, 
the attitude, and the ease with which you make connections. Shortly afterwards, I graduated and received a call from this person offering me a position. At the time, everything pointed to me working in a regular laboratory. This is his genesis we're, we're going through right now. I did a series of three increasingly suspicious interviews, each in a different location where my scientific background and knowledge became less and less relevant. The first was with two of the senior scientists, the second and third with people I'd never see again and who were obviously not interested in science. Sometime after the interview, I was asked to go to a fourth location where what seemed like a corporate lawyer presented me with an NDA. He made sure not to explain every detail, but also that I understood the consequence of not respecting it. Now, obviously, we've heard of NDAs before. This is nothing new in this private sector. The first employment weeks were by far the most memorable. Although I spent most of the time in a depressing archive room, it consists almost exclusively of reading about the subject of, st of study and to get us up to speed. There's no secret Wikipedia or even a reference book to guide us. There are only dry reports, memos, presentations, procedures, and SOPs. What are SOPs? Ah, standard operating procedure. I'm learning too. This isn't, uh, I'm not an all-knowing wise person. I'm, I'm, I'm learning as I read, and I look forward to learning more. These documents are almost exclusively about the biology of the EBOs, but there are also a few that deal with other subjects, such as their food, religion, or culture. There were no documents on their technology. Fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. When I think about these beings, and I think about the interactions that they could have potentially had with humans, you know, i.e. abductions or first contact or run-ins or close encounters of the third kind in general. I think about the fact that we're only seeing a very small portion of who they represent or what they represent. Their culture is never brought up. Take this example, for instance, if a CIA agent went to an island that had never contacted modern human civilization, and he showed up in a suit with sunglasses, you know, in an earpiece. That representation of man would be their only depiction of people coming in from the outside. That would be how they perceive other life outside of that island. Everybody would resemble them until proven otherwise. And that's kind of what we're dealing with too. You know, these encounters that we've had are always taking place in a sliver of the greater picture. There's always like a laboratory or there's always like some type of test condition. But we don't get to see if they listen to music or if they or if they paint or if they have conversations among themselves that has nothing to do with the study of the human body. Right. So there is a whole other aspect of life. And that to me is really intriguing because I think that's probably the most rare glimpse of all, like the people on that island I just referred to probably are not going to speculate that this CIA agent on the weekends, you know, watches the game with his buddies and maybe goes uh, and plays baseball, right? He has no idea that any of those things really exist. As mentioned above, the aim of the project is to gain a better understanding of the EBO's genome and proteome. To achieve this, a team of around 20 scientists, four senior scientists, and a director was involved. The scientists, like myself, had their main responsibility to carry out the technical work. As each scientist had, to my knowledge, a PhD, we were all somewhat overqualified for what is ultimately a technician's job. The senior scientists, who make the full use of their diplomas, had the task of designing the assays. I'm pretty... Did he, did he misspell essays? Oh, assay. Assay? Assay. It's the uh, measure and concentration or activity of bio... Uh, chemical molecules, immunoassays, they use antibodies to detect specific proteins or molecules. Okay, so these are molecular tests, essentially. And here I am trying to correct someone with a PhD. Yeah, that is clearly, that is me, in a nutshell. Uh, designing assays, assays, I don't know how to pronounce this word, and a, supervise, and a supervisory responsibility. They were also in charge of training new employees, and sometimes even came in to do technical work. The director, of course, was the person in charge who dictated priorities to the senior scientists. He was rarely on site, and the few times he was, 
it was to attend meetings. Other than the scientific staff, there were security guards working for one subcontractor or another. There were no support staff such as janitors or maintenance workers. Scientists were responsible for this kind of work. In addition, logistical constraints ensure that every scientist is capable of carrying out any technical activity. This is a really interesting point to bring up because often you think of these places and you're like, well, who cleans them? Who washes the toilets? Who, you know, feeds them during lunch hour at the cafeteria? But I suppose that in a place this secretive, you got to just kind of at certain points fend for yourself. You can't have every, you can't read everyone in. <laughs> Could you imagine showing up, you know, being hired as like a janitor and being in one of these labs? Not going to happen. It's a great point to bring up and helps prove, you know, a little bit of credibility, I believe. The laboratory itself is located in Fort Detrick, Maryland. I'm guessing this is a red herring. There's no way that this guy would blatantly, because that would place him at that area. And, you know, out of 20 people, I'm pretty sure he would be very easy to find. You know, you got a list of 20 people who's one guy that, you know, it's, it'd be too easy to backtrack. So I... I'm going to look into this, but I do not believe this whatsoever. Currently editing. Sorry for the bad sound. This is my little little editing camera. I looked up Fort Detrick. Well, actually, without looking up Fort Detrick, I typed into Google, which military base in the U.S. looks into biomedical research? And the number one result was Fort Detrick. So Fort Detrick is actually known for their biomedical research. They've researched Ebola. There was actually a rumor that COVID started in Fort Detrick from uh, the Chinese. So is that a red flag? Is that a red herring? I mean, if they were doing advanced biomedical research, that would be a place that they did it. But it seems all too obvious to me. But who knows? What do you think? Uh, in a building used for legitimate biomedical research. The clandestine operations are carried out in a restricted part of the basement, out of sight from regular workers. Contrary to what one might imagine, the biosafety level is not maximal for this type of research. Indeed, the lab containing EBO samples or derived cell cultures is BSL-3. All right. Biosafety level 3, which is a containment level used in laboratories to handle infectious agents that may cause serious or potential lethal diseases through inhalation. It is one of four biosafety levels, BSL-1 to BSL-4. Oh, so BSL-1, basic with minimal risk, two, moderate risk, like E. coli, hepatitis A, and four is high risk, highest risk, like Ebola. Some guidelines in BSL-3, but it's not as high as BSL-4. So he says, the lab containing EBO samples is BSL-3, while the lab where the assays are conducted are only BSL-2, the BSL-3 area of the facility includes a freezer room and a cell culture lab that is only accessible through an antechamber from the BSL-2 section. EBO carcasses are preserved in horizontal freezers at a temperature of negative 80 degrees Celsius nominal. To maximize the preservation of these carcasses, they are preserved in vacuum bags and the air in the room is controlled to minimize humidity. There are only four bodies and one of them and none of them are complete. It's obvious that these creatures have died as a result of major trauma. I've never witnessed a motorcycle accident fatality, but it probably looks similar to this. It is acknowledged that there are more EBO carcasses at other locations. The Cell Culture Laboratory, as its name suggests, is where cell lines derived from EBOs are grown and related activities are performed. I'll talk in more detail about these specific cell lines later on. The BSL-2 part is mainly used for assays, immunohistochemistry, genetic engineering, immunocytochemistry, storage, etc. There's also a cell culture lab, but this is used for more traditional cell lines. Other than the labs, there are all the amenities you could find in an office. Note that the internet access is limited to senior staff and up. There is, however, an intranet for bioinformatic needs. If you're wondering what intranet is, I first heard this term when a documentary came out about North Korea. Yeah, intranet. 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 Yes. intranet. Yes, intranet. All the, all the information we need. How they sort of emulated the, f the feel and made a facade of the internet, uh, making it look like the internet, 
but obviously a limited amount of information is available. So when you uh, search something up or Google something, it's just searching within the database that it has already. So it's not, does not have access to the internet. On the subject of biology of these beings, I'll start by discussing genetics, then their gross anatomy, and finally their biological systems. For the sake of clarity, the information that I provide here is an aggregation of what I have observed and what I have read. I will make many comparisons with human anatomy because it is almost because it is the most logical reference. Fair enough. Folks, we start on genetics. First, I'd like to discuss their genetics. Their genetics like ours based on DNA. This fact was very puzzling for me when I first learned about it. We imagine that beings from an alternate biosphere would have genetics based on a completely foreign biochemical system, and surprisingly, this is not the case. Several conclusions can be drawn from this surprising revelation. The one that immediately comes to mind is that our biosphere and theirs share a common ancestry. You know, this brings up the work of Michael Masters, famous uh, anthropologist who's looking into these extra tempestrial beings or us from the future. You know, it would make most sense if they're upright with two arms and a head that they stem from the same genetic history. There is no other animal in the animal kingdom that behaves this way. So, you know, natural leap would be to look at us. They're eukaryotes. Okay. I will never pretend to know something. I would always rather learn. Eukaryotes are organisms whose cell contain a nucleus. They are one of three domains of life alongside archaea and bacteria. Okay. So they're just saying they're like they're like a sentient living things, I suppose. They're eukaryotes, which means their cells have nuclei containing genetic material, which suggests that their biosphere would have been separated from ours sometime after the appearance of this type of organism. So the term exobiospheric organism is actually a misnomer, but as it's a historical term, it's still used. Their genetics are not only based on the same genetic system, but they're also even compatible with their own cellular machinery. This means that you can take a human gene and insert it into an EBO cell, and that gene will be translated into protein. And this, of course, works in reverse with a human gene inserted into an EBO cell. I think he got those mixed up. I think he meant to say an EBO cell inserted into a human gene because he did say the same thing twice. There are important differences in post-translational modifications that will make the final protein non-functional, but I'll discuss these later. Their genome consists of 16 circular chromosomes. How many chromosomes does our genome consist of? 46 chromosomes it organized into 23 parts. Okay. So a simpler set of chromosomes, it would seem, or a simpler genome. I speak... Out of my ass, by the way. So don't don't listen to me. I once got a I once got a ninety five percent on one of my biology tests, and that's about as far as my molecular biological education goes. Okay, you're probably familiar with the concept of intergenetic region or junk DNA. Nope, I am not. I am not familiar with that. These are basically DNA sequences that don't code for proteins. These are evolutionary residues, transposons, inactivated genes, and so on. To give you an idea, in humans, intergenetic regions represent approximately 99% of our genome. I'm aware that these sequences aren't completely useless. They can be used as histone anchors, as buffers to protect coding DNA from radiation, or even as an alternative open reading frames, but that's rather peripheral. What's particularly striking about EBO genome is the uniformity of these intergenetic regions. We see the same sequences repeated everywhere. And the distance in BP base pair, a unit of measurement used to describe the length of DNA and RNA molecules. The result is a minimalist, highly condensed genome. In fact, it's much smaller than ours. Moreover, the quantity of protein coding genes is even significantly lower than ours, probably due to genetic refinement, but also to biological processes that are absent in EBO. The uniformity of these sequences is a major indication of the, artificial, of the artificiality of these beings. There is no complex organism on Earth that has such elegance in its sequences. There is no evolutionary pressure that can lead to this kind of characteristic other than genetic engineering. 
And my friends, that is something that is very fascinating because it's also something we find, I think, I believe, in the alloys of the crafts that have been uh, discovered through these crafts retrievals. Uh, the alloys, apparently, as well, the way that they line up on a molecular or even atomic base is almost perfect. It is fabricated. And I think that's what he's saying here. I think the complexity is too simple. Evolution is a muddy, dirty game. It, 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 it's messy, and it leaves remnants and clues. None of those are apparent here, is what I'm reading. I mean, and hold on. Speaking of genetic engineering, you know, that is no secret to UFO lore. These genetic experiments performed on man or in conjunction with the ETs or the NHI in order to, whether it's create some type of hybrid or to enhance, you know, human DNA, as mentioned by Representative Boebert in that UAP hearing recently. This is all very interesting. Speaking of genetic engineering, following sequencing of their genomes, we noticed a troubling and universal characteristic in the five, uh, five foot of the regulatory, or five dash, five comma, of the regulatory sequence of each gene, which we call the tripalindromic region. Okay, the TPR. The TPR are 134 BP sequences containing, as its name suggests, three palindromes. In genetics, a palindrome is a DNA sequence that when read in the same direction, gives the same sequence on both DNA strands. They serve both as a flag and as a binding site for proteins. The three palindromes in the TPR are distinct from one another and have been poetically named 5PTPR, MTPR, and 3TPR. Is this, is this Edgar Allan Poe? The TPR is composed in five to three order. A 5TPR, 12BP spacer, chromosomal, Chromosomal address, 12 B T BP spacer, MTPR, 12 BP spacer, gene address, 12 BP spacer, and then 3 TPR. Please, if anyone out there with, a, with any modicum of idea of what any of this means, is there any way that you can translate this into layman terms for me? Let me see what chat sheep... This is why we have this technology. In the paragraph that starts with speaking of genetic engineering, can you dumb it down for me as if I was a sixth grader? When scientists looked at the EBO's DNA, they found something really interesting. There was a special pattern in their DNA called TPR, which is the same on both strands of their DNA when you read it in the same direction. These patterns are likely markers or flags, or like markers or flags that help proteins know where to go. What's cool, <laughs> I like how they're, they're saying the word cool like I'm in grade six, which I appreciate. What's cool is that these TPR patterns are exactly the same in every part of their DNA, but they're also totally unique for each of their 16 DNA loops or chromosomes. Each loop has its own address made up of these patterns. This address acts, acts like a map telling where each gene is in their DNA. This level of organization is super neat and precise something we don't see in any living thing on Earth. It's so precise that scientists think these patterns weren't made by nature. Instead, it seems like someone or something designed it very carefully, almost like programming a computer. This is why people think EBOs might have been genetically engineered. Yeah, you see, that's what I'm talking about. I will continue reading in case there is someone out there that understands this jargon. The chromosomal address is composed of 4BP and is identical in each TPR of the same chromosome, but distinction between each of the 16 chromosomes of the genome, but distinct between. The gene address is a 64BP sequence that is unique for each gene in the, identif in the whole genome. It's therefore understandable that the TPR serves as a unique address, not only for numerically identifying a gene, but also for identifying its chromosomal location. For those with only a basic knowledge of genetics, this is completely unheard of. No living thing in our biosphere has this kind of precise address in its genome. Once again, the presence of TPR cannot be explained by evolutionary pressure, but only by genetic engineering or on a genomic scale. This guy says, according to the way that things are laid out, I guess it's so complementary or everything 
behaves in such a specific manner and has such a specific function that, you know, this is by this is by no means an accident. TPR opens the door to several possibilities. One of them suggests that EBO geneticists can insert or remove a gene from a cell in a way that is far more targeted and efficient than our technology allows. No proteins have been identified in the EBO genome that interacts with TPR. Rather, we believe that these proteins are exclusively targeted by external genetic engineering tools, probably used at the zygotic stage of embryonic development. The nature of these tools is unclear, but we definitely don't have anything like them. The probable absence of these proteins from the genome is a further indication of their artificiality. Given the high probability of artificiality of their genome and the apparent ease of modifying it with biomolecular tools, it's not out of the question that there could be polymorphism between individuals depending on their role and function. In other words, an individual could be genetically designed to have characteristics that give it an advantage in performing a given task like soldier ants and worker ants in an anthill. Note that these previous statements are speculation. To my knowledge, only one individual genome has been sequenced. I can't make definitive statements on genetic variation between individuals. This is interesting. I've said this, this is something I mentioned in the 4chan Q&A was, you know, if you're gonna create these, you probably have like options. You know, if let's say I was going biological drone shopping, I would want one that's maybe more psychic. I would want a pilot one to fly the craft. I would want uh, one with muscles to like lift things. One with, you know, one very tall so we can reach the things that are very, one very short for opposite reasons. You know, perhaps there are, you know, made to spec versions of these EBOs. I talked a lot about intergenetic regions. Now I'll briefly dis discuss intragenetic sequences. Briefly, because there's not a lot less to say despite its obvious importance. Much like ours, these genes have silencers, enhancers, promoters, 5 UTRs, exons, introns, and 3 UTRs, etc. There are many genes analogous to ours, which is not surprising given the compatibility of our cellular machinery. What's disturbing is that some genes correspond directly, nucleotide by nucleotide, with known human genes or even some animal genes. I'm guessing cows. Why they do it is nebulous and still subject to conjecture. There are also many genes which are not found in our biosphere whose role has not been identified. Finding the purpose of these novel genes is one of the aims of the program. I'd like to note before going any further that this heterogeneity of genes of known and unknown origin is an undeniable proof of the artificiality of EBOs. To conclude with genetics, the mitochondrial genome at the time I was working there had not yet been sequenced. It's safe to assume that this genome would also be streamlined and, possibil and possibly has some version of TPR. This person is saying without a shadow of a doubt that he has or they have proved that these EBOs are artificially made on several accounts. Based on genetic sequencing alone, he can prove that there is no way that these things were made by accident or through evolution. Obvious question comes to mind. What's making these things? There are actually few cases where abductees get to see a little bit behind the curtain. And one of those cases happened to be Travis Walton, where he once on the medical examination table was being observed by multiple conventional gray types eventually sort of fought them off, walked into a separate room where he encountered more humanoid looking species, whether hybrids or something else, I don't know, who knows, but there is something making these EBOs and by extension, the crafts that they fly in. And apparently we're not uh, important enough to deserve some of their time. We only get to, you know, we only get to interact very seldom with the worker bees. All right, the transcription and translation and protein expression. I briefly introduced the differences in post-translational modifications between human and EBO. This is hardly a surprise, as we often see the same thing between different terrestrial species. Obtaining a viable protein from a DNA sequence is a complex process involving hundreds of protein intermediates, each with a precise and essential role. A minor variation in this assembly line can lead to functional irregularities in the final product. 
So it's no surprise that there are setbacks along the way when the first EBO gene transfection attempts failed to produce the desired functional protein in human cell lines. Fortunately for us, the work of what I imagine to be another team at another site has led to the development of an EBO cell line named EPI-G11, derived from epithe epithelial tissues. Epithelial tissues? With this tool in our hands, we were able to transfect and overexpress proteins of interest in order to eventually purify and study them. For your information, we use a biological ballistics delivery system, aka a gene gun, for our transfection needs because other methods are not very effective with gene cells with cells of this line. For example, the viral vectors tested cannot be internalized by EPIG11 and lipofection is too lethal. EPG11, like most eukaryotic cell lines, enters a phase of exponential growth when exposed to fetal bovine serum. It's only half surprising that a cell line from such an exotic source uh, should be sensitive to growth factors present in FBS. In my opinion, this can be explained by the addition of animal genes to the genome, such as growth receptors. I mean, even mentioning bovine connects the dots itself. I mean, it, maybe there's a reason these cattle mutilations happened. And part of that reason goes into the compatibility that the bovine has with human and EBO genetics. We're getting some answers here. This is quite fascinating. I wonder if this person is even aware of cattle mutilations. Obviously, if he's LARPing, he is. Gross anatomy. Here we go. This is this is the stuff that's uh, a little a little more direct uh, in physical appearance. They are morphologically very similar to the gray aliens that are part of modern folklore. Their height is about 150 centimeters. They have two arms, two legs, and a head. Still, there are some notable differences. Skin. The gray skin that is often described in folklore is in fact a biosynthetic film, which likely serves to protect the EBO from a hostile environment. It doesn't provide effective protection against temperature changes, but it does offer adequate protection against the passage of liquids. It's possible that this film confers other advantages, but my knowledge on the subject is limited. Under the gray film, the epidermis is rather white and the texture is very regular and without any hair. We do not see any defect other than the folds near the joints. It's described as greasy in one report, but that's not something I've observed. The same report states that a strong lingering smell of burnt hair and ammonia is present when the film is removed. There are a lot of pores on the skin crossing from the epidermis to a gland in the hypodermis. These glands and pores are the terminal part of the excretory sudoriferous system, which could explain the previously mentioned smell. What are we saying here? So many connections to be made. Number one, they poop from their skin. This is what we're saying here. Sudoriferous system, the excretory sudoriferous system. Their excrement is secreted from their skin. This excrement also, perhaps, acts as a layer of protection to the things it might be vulnerable to in our biosphere. Bacteria, viral, perhaps. Now, if we look at the case in Virginia, Brazil, two things can be drawn from this paragraph. One, the smell. Hundreds of witnesses, including doctors, all said that the entire hospital that this being was brought into smelt like ammonia and sulfur. It was so strong, they had to shut down an entire wing for a week. But what did it smell like? It smelled like a strong, misturated type of sulfur and ammonia. When they took whatever it was in that black bag and they left the hospital, the military and the police, with that bag and that thing, did the smell leave? That's how strong it was. And this smelled, this smell lingered throughout the town. Number two, the alleged Brazilian officer that captured one of these beings and held it in his arms who eventually died, uh, but this man brought it into the hospital and he died of uh, general infection, I think was what they coined it. His interaction with this 
slime that was present on these beings caused a general affection and, and killed this man. Meu nome é Marta, Marta Tavares, sou irmã do militar que se envolveu no caso do extraterrestre em janeiro de 1996. E aí de manhã, às 7 horas da manhã, ele falou para mim o seguinte, ó, procura saber o que que eu tenho, que eu quero saber o que que eu tenho, que eu não tô sentindo nada. E ele foi pro CTI. Do CTI, 15 para o meio-dia, ele veio a óbito. O doutor Luiz Severo, Luiz Alberto Severo, que era o plantonista do CTI no dia, pediu para que fosse feito o um enterro o mais rápido possível. Much like if you were to go and visit an uncontacted tribe and give them COVID. Same deal would happen. Their immune systems are just built for different uh, viruses than ours are. And what I'm also gathering is that this person did not see the film, did not have the smell because these bodies have been preserved and are wiped clean. But that was what he read in the report. The head. The head contains two large oversized eyes, two nostrils without protuberance, and a narrow mouth without lips, two ear canals without oracles. There is a mandible, but the musculature is vestigial. There are no teeth or tongue in the oral cavity. Whoa, no tongue? I mean, yeah, obviously if you're communicating telepathically, you have no use for a tongue. And I guess they don't eat. The nasal cavity where the nostrils meet is compact, but does not rise cranially but extends axially. It appears to be no equivalent to the olfactory bulb in the nasal cavity. The mouth leads directly to the esophagus and the nasal cavity to the trachea. The trachea and esophagus do not communicate. So they breathe through their nose exclusively and they eat through their mouth exclusively. So there is no flap between the trachea and the esophagus, uh, you know, so if they eat or they drink or they uh, consume anything, it goes straight into the stomach or whatever cavity they have there. And when they breathe, that goes straight into the lungs or whatever organ they have there. And that does seem like a more efficient thing when you think about it. Like evolutionarily speaking, us having one tube for both breathing and eating has definitely caused a lot of trouble in our past. <laughs> it's not a, the greatest evolutionary trait. These things seem to have circumvented that when creating the EBOs. Ooh, the eyes. The famous eyes. Like the skin, the eyes are covered with a semi-transparent biosynthetic film that offers the same environmental protection. Makes sense. While providing protection against certain wavelengths and light intensity. So they, they're wearing sunglasses on their eyes, essentially. When the film is removed, a more traditional eye is revealed. It's about three times larger than a human eye, and there are no eyelids. The size of the eye suggests that they have excellent night vision. Is that a thing? Is that an actual correlation that can be made? Is that like the bigger your eyes, the more you see at night? I suppose owls do have big eyes, but we don't have great night vision, and I assume that horses don't either. It's an interesting, maybe, maybe a little red flag or red herring. Who knows? It seems paradoxical to cover them with a semi-opaque film. Perhaps they only need to wear it in a bright environment. Their sclera... Oh, by the way, the 4chan whistleblower had also mentioned that their eyes don't see like ours. Like they can see... They can stare at the sun without it hurting. And perhaps that is due to the film. The sclera is the same color as their skin. The iris is a pale gray and the pupil is black and oversized. See, see an oversized pupil, for me, that would indicate better night vision, right? When your pupils dilates because it's taking in more light. The lens is rounder than a human and the musculature used to adjust focus is more developed. On the retina, there are at least six types of cone cells. The responsiveness of each of these six types of cone is, a spe is specific to a wavelength band with a minimum of overlap between each other. The result is a broader visible spectrum. So they can possibly potentially see infrared, ultraviolet, or you know, some other spectrum that we're not aware of. Ear. As mentioned, the outer ear has no oracle. The ear canal is unremarkable. 
The inner ear has all the characteristics of a typical vestibular and cochlear system, although the curvature of the cochlea is more pronounced than a human. This probably results in greater hearing acuity for low frequencies. Okay, why would that be important? The brain is tetraspheric i.e. composed of four major sections. The sections are separated by transverse and longitudinal fissures and are connected to the central lobe, which acts as a brainstem and cerebellum. The volume of the brain is around 20% superior to that of a man of the same height. It has much more pronounced level of gyrosation than an average human. Moreover, the ratio of glial cells to neurons is also slightly higher than in humans. It is important to mention the presence of nodules on the central lobe. Get this. Histological analysis of these structures reveals a kind of intricate biological circuitry. It is speculated that these nodules are essential to interact with their technology. Consequently, determining the proteome of these structures is an absolute priority for the program. Now we're talking. Now we're talking about a genetically modified brain that is made to interface with their technology. This is why, according to the 4chan leak, they couldn't fly the crafts like these things flew them. They couldn't maintain concentration long enough because any distraction would break that bond they had with the technology and the craft, you know, wouldn't function as intended. So this is kind of like a biological version of Neuralink. When you think about it, Neuralink is exactly some, you know, technological node that we use to enhance our own brain that we can control things with remotely. And that's exactly what they're doing. So this would explain a whole lot of how their technology functions. And what's interesting to me is that this doesn't seem to be an evolutionary thing, you know, so as we're evolving as humans, we might think one day we will be psychic and connect with everything. But maybe it isn't that at all. Maybe it takes active genetic modifications in order for us to be able to unlock these psychic traits. Big speculation here, okay? We're going far, we're going deep. Neck. The neck is proportionately longer than that of a human, and at the same time, relatively thin. As mentioned, the esophagus and trachea are separate. There are no vocal cords in this region, so they will not be appearing on the voice. Thorax. The musculature of the thorax is underdeveloped. Muscles equivalent to the pectoralis major can be seen. All right, they got a little bit of pecs. We can also see the trapezius and the deltoid muscles. The sternocleidomastoids are well-defined. The ribs and sternum are clearly visible. There are no nipples. Which would make sense. There's no use for them if they're not breeding. You know, and if these things were artificially manufactured, that would make sense. Abdomen, the abdomen is wider than the thorax and bulges slightly forward. There is no navel, no belly button, and they got little bellies. Little bulgy bellies. What a weird, that is a strange uh, trait to give them. To be like, we'll make them like this, and then also give them a little, give them a little pot belly. Pelvis. The pelvic bones are apparent. There are no genitals or anus. Hands and feet. Their hands have four digits, including an opposable thumb on the medial side. They have no nails, and the texture of their fingerprints is composed of concentric circles. Fingers are proportionally much larger than in humans. Unlike humans, finger musculature is entirely intrinsic to the hand. In other words, the muscles used to move the fingers are not in the forearms, but are entirely located in the hands. At first glance, the feet consist of just two digits, but necropsy soon determined that each toe was made of two fused digits. The medial toe is marginally larger, uh, longer than the distal toe. The feet are relatively longer, narrower than in human. Their musculature, however, is vestigial. So their toes are kind of like this. So you think it's two, but upon further inspection, it's like four fused into two. 
The EBO skeleton is very similar to ours, at least in terms of composition. There's collagen, hydroxyapatite, but also copper oxide crystals where marrow could normally be found. The role of these crystals has not been established, but it is not a crystallopathic condition. The blood cells of the myeloid lineage, or the equivalent for these creatures, therefore mature in a different location than in humans, i.e. in the thymus-like organ. A transverse section of the bone reveals osteon and osteocytes. There appear to be few osteoblasts and no osteoclasts. This indicates that the bones are no longer growing and cannot absorb minerals present or adapt mechanically to changes in posture. So, they are not flexible. They, are prob they probably move in a robotic fashion, which has been documented by multiple close encounters. A lot of people say these things move like robots. They're kind of like robotic in nature. And that would, that would be explained by, you know, their skeletal system. The bones are no longer growing and can't absorb minerals. You know, this also tells me that these things have been like made in a test tube or in some type of vat and they were just like congened because, you know, the absence of that would indicate that they've never had it so that they, you never see a gray baby. They were just manufactured this way. And again, no use for overcomplicating the genetics of these creatures. Everything seems to be very simple. I mean, it does make it optimal when creating these things, but perhaps there's another reason as well. The respiratory system. Their cellular respiration is equivalent to ours, i.e. they need to oxidize organic components to produce energy. Their lungs have no reciprocating action, but rather have a unidirectional flow of air similar to those seen in birds, which is more efficient than ours. Again, efficiency is key here. It is speculated that this is in response to the brain's elevated metabolic needs. So because the brain is bigger, it needs more oxygen. Vocalization is produced by vibration of the wall membrane at the junction between the two air sacs. So there's these two air sacs and there's a membrane that they vibrate in order to make noise. Now, what kind of noise could these things possibly make? Now, there are reports of like gargling sound. There are reports of growling like dogs. The circulatory system of EBOs is rather analogous to ours. The heart is located in the mediastinum, in the mediastinum but in a more medial position, directly beneath the sternum. The heart has two ventricles and two atria. There is an aorta, a pulmonary vein, a pulmonary artery, and a vena cava. Blood flowing to the pulmonary capillaries via the pulmonary artery is pumped against the flow of air, maximizing gas exchange efficiency. The blood gas barrier is relatively narrow in these capillaries, at least compared to a human. The oxygen-rich blood is returned to the heart and then expelled onto the aorta and the rest of the body. Before returning to the heart, the blood will pass through the hepaterenal organ, which, among other things, filters and controls osmotic pressure of the blood. The blood itself is analogous to that of a human. However, the proportion of plasma is much higher. Albumin is in similar proportion. Hormone levels are much lower. Metal ion levels are much higher, particularly copper, and glucose levels are significantly higher. The color of the blood is brownish, given the higher proportion of plasma and concentration of metal ions. On the cellular side, there are erythrocytes, which in addition to hemoglobin for, ion, uh, for binding oxygen, display several complexes capable of binding copper ions. It's not clear what role these copper ions play, but we believe it neutralizes blood ammonia, among other things. Several cell types with leukocyte characteristics have been observed, but no comprehensive knowledge of them exists. Platelets are present, but in smaller proportions than in humans. Okay. Not completely familiar with all of those uh, terms. Perhaps in the comments, you guys do your thing. Excreto sudiferous system. All right, we're talking about skin pooping. Here we go. Technically speaking, of course. The system is completely different from what I've seen. 
As mentioned earlier, there is no large orifice, like an anus or urethra, to get rid of biological waste. Instead, there are countless small pores on the surface of the skin. There's a large medial organ called the hepaterenal organ, which acts as both kidney and liver, and is central to maintaining uh, homeostasis. This organ is highly vascularized, and the blood must pass through it before returning to the heart. Its role is, among other things, to purify the blood of meta metabolic waste. Waste is secreted into the equivalent of a ureter, which branches out into four. Each branch flows towards one of the four limbs, and in turn, these branches divide until they end up as thousands of excretory pores. The motility of this excretory system is mediated by a weak peristalsis at the proximal level and on the four main branches. Peristalsis ceases around the first distal junction as there is no urea cycle. The ammonia concentration at the exit of the hepaterenal organ is very high. This ammonia is carried to the pores and gives the distinct odor I mentioned earlier. The rationale behind this unusual excretory system is directly related to this excreted ammonia, which enables thermoregulation by evaporating on the skin's surface. Huh, it evaporates. And a corresponding increase in metabolic waste via amino acid catabolism. This leads to an increase in filtration and ammonia excretion, which ultimately lowers the body temperature so it keeps them cool. At the same time, it serves as a shield, it serves as a, as, as a temperature regulation, it serves as excreting waste. Very efficient. I do want to see how, JatGP, how ChatGPT um, translates this real quick. Now break down the excreto sudiferous system. So they don't have a big opening like an anus or urethra to expel waste. There's a special organ called the hypoterenal organ, which is like liver and kidneys. They got an organ that acts like liver and kidneys. That organ helps take all the trash out of the blood before it goes to the heart. The waste, which is ammonia, leaves the body through the skin pores, but not directly. First, it goes through the tube called the ureter, which branches out uh, like it branches out to four on the limbs, but then to thousands of pores. These tubes work together to push waste out of the pores using a rhythmic squeezing motion called peristalsis. So rhythmic, sort of like, almost like blood pumping, perhaps. The waste exits as a liquid through the skin, which cools their body down, kind of like, kind of like sweating in humans. I see. Okay, so they sweat uh, this ammonia. It's like sweat for them. That's what cools them down. I see. The more active they are, the more heat they produce, and the more sweat, the more they sweat out this ammonia. This leads to faster waste removal and helps them cool down after physical activity. And that would explain the smell in Virginia, because these creatures were seen running around and being chased and possibly terrified, increasing the amount of ammonia being secreted from their skin, thus, you know, making the whole town stink. Digestive system, their tummies. The digestive system is extremely underdeveloped. No stomach in the familiar sense. However, there is a pseudo stomach located at the transition between the thoracic and abdo abdominal cavities. This organ is not involved in digestion, but only serves as a reservoir. A sphincter controls the flow of food into the intestine. The intestine is limited to the equivalent of our small intestine, i.e. it only serves to absorb liquids and nutrients and acts as the main digestion site. It has villi and microvilli like ours. The intestine ends in the hepaterenal organ, okay, where non-digested matter is transported to ureter and the excretory system. There's an organ near the pseudostomachal sphincter that secretes digestive enzymes directly into the intestine. This organ is inspirationally called the digestive organ. It secretes mainly proteolytic enzymes, and glycoside hydrolases. All right. So it, it secretes stuff to break down the food. But what food? What are they eating? Given the absence of teeth, the narrowness and rigidity of the esophagus, the absence of a true stomach, and the absence of defecation strongly believe that EBOs can only consume food in liquid form. 
It is assumed that given the high metabolic needs of their brains, this food would have a high carbohydrate concentration. In order to meet other metabolic needs, there must also be a high protein content in the food consumed. These two statements are supported by the type of enzymes secreted by the digestive organ. It is therefore speculated that the food consumed is a sort of broth rich in sugar and protein, which probably also has a high copper content. Given the strict limitations on the type of food that they can consume, it's unlikely that this type of creature could survive in our biosphere without technological support. I wonder if they're making beef shakes out of these cattle mutilations. Endocrine system. Knowledge of the endocrine system is minimal. We know that the cells are receptive to bovine growth hormones, so it's assumed that certain functions are regulated by such a system. Endocrine systems are very complex, and it goes without saying that they are best studied on living subjects. The immune system is another unknown. There seems to be an innate immune system, but there doesn't seem to be any adaptive immunity, at least not similar to what is known. There's a thymus-like organ near the heart that's proportionally larger than in humans. This organ seems to be where all the blood cells mature. Some cells have leukocyte characteristics such as granularity. The immune cells that germinate here have a higher copper concentration. The surface receptors of innate immune cells have not yet been characterized, so we might as well say that all the work remains to be done. Nervous system. The nervous system is also relatively similar. The spinal cord begins at the base of the central lobe of the brain and propagates down the, verte the vertebral column. In the vertebrae, there are ganglia made of afferent and efferent neurons. In short, other than the, CN the CNS, the central nervous system, there is nothing out of the ordinary. The musculoskeletal system. The musculoskeletal system is very ordinary, albeit underdeveloped. Most of the human skeletal muscles have an equivalent. Only the hands and feet and forearms are different. It should be noted that the proportion of type 1 and type 2 muscle fibers is different from that in the human. Indeed, type 1 outnumbers type 2 by a factor of 10. What's the difference between a type 1 and type 2 muscle system? Learning so much today about biology, it's pretty... It's fun being an adult with technology sometimes. So the muscle fiber differences lies in their structure function and how they generate energy for activity. So type 1, uh, the function specialized for endurance activities and sustained efforts designed to resist fatigue. And then type 2, obviously, a mix of endurance and power capabilities. And it says here type 1 outnumbers type 2 by a factor of 10. So these things are not strong. Uh, they're, they're, you know, they're not going to be any arm wrestling champions, uh, but they might run a marathon. I could probably beat the crap out of one of these things, um, to say the least. And that, I think that's been the case with some of these close encounters as well, is that you can physically, you know, overcome their tiny little skeletal systems pretty rapidly. We speculate that art. Okay. So the artificial system, we speculate that the artificial molecular machines may be present in the body and that copper, if present, would be essential to their function or assembly. Important, no AMMs have been observed. It says here it likely refers to a specific type of biological molecule or mechanism related to the EBO. AMM is shorthand for artificial molecular mechanism. All right, and that is the end of this person's analysis. There are then uh, a few questions he answers, not very many. And we're going to answer and we're going to take a look at those right now. Question one, amazing story. Have you shared this with the Senate Select Commission on Intelligence or with Arrow? Or do you have evidence to back this up? Thank you. No, I haven't. And no, I won't. It sounds like a honey trap to me. I will not place my life in the hands of politicians. I have no proof other than this message. I know it's not much, but it's what I'm prepared to offer. Fair. Totally fair. And I, I mean, totally fair. I'm not going to blame him for that. Question two. Well, that was a read. So they are bioengineered worker bees. Any elemental components that are unattributable to our biome? Yes, knowing they're disposable, unable to live independently without technological support, and that they're ephemeral. The only suitable hypothesis is that they're alive only to accomplish their task. Can you clarify the question about elemental components? Didn't he also mention like religion and culture at the beginning of this document that wasn't addressed, it seems? Question three, I haven't read everything in detail, but can you expand on the document on their religion? Uh, here we go. EBOs believe, okay, this part here, folks, I could make a whole video on simply, 
I could make a whole video on this part alone. This is the most fascinating part for me uh, because it not only talks about religion, the soul, all this stuff, but it's deeply philosophical when you think about it as well. Whew. All right, strap yourselves in for this. EBOs believe that the soul is not an extension of the individual, but rather a fundamental characteristic of nature that expresses itself as a field, not unlike gravity. Again, they're saying the soul, the soul isn't proprietary to the individual, but it's a fundamental characteristic of nature, that it's a part of a field. Quantum consciousness, perhaps? In the presence of life, this field acquires complexity, resulting in negative entropy, if that makes sense. Stay with me here. This gain in complexity is directly correlated with the concentration of living organisms in a given location. With time and with the right conditions, life in turn becomes more complex until the appearance of sentient life. After reaching this threshold, the field begins to express itself through these sentient beings, forming what we call a soul. Through their life experiences, sentient beings will in turn influence the field in a sort of positive feedback loop. This in turn further accelerates the complexity of the field. Eventually, when the field reaches a critical mass, there will be a sort of apotheosis, uh, a culmination or a peak or a, an event, some spiritual event. It's not clear what this means in practical terms, but the quest for this apotheosis seems to be the EBO's main motivation. Let's break this down real quick. Negative entropy creates more complex sequences of consciousness, which in turn end up forming life. The more complex this life grows into, the more it sort of attracts this quantum consciousness field, this soul field or whatever you want to call it. And the more it attracts this soul field, the more complex it grows and so on and so forth, creating this loop at the end of which the hypothesis is that it reaches a critical mass or an apotheosis and something happens. The way that I see it is that this quantum consciousness, we won't call it a soul, we're, or I'm going to call it quantum consciousness because it's like a field. It exists everywhere omnipresently. This quantum consciousness uh, ends up through negative entr entropy, creating very complex life that in turn starts to express itself. So we are the universe, first of all, expressing itself. The universe wants to dance. The universe wants to sing. It wants to make videos. It wants to just express itself in fear and in anger and in happiness and all these different things. And it creates these little nodules known as humans uh, that have a concentration of its consciousness in order to be able to express itself. This is how I see it. Now, the more complex that these organisms grow in a layman version, the more they become this antenna for this quantum field of consciousness. So the more in turn, they're possibly able to actually manipulate this field. For instance, um, a dog being not as complex a creature as a human will have a limited interaction with this quantum field of consciousness. A human being a little bit more complex through meditative states, through artificial induced, you know, hallucinations, perhaps can have a little bit more contact with this quantum field of consciousness. Take it a step further, these EBEs or even whatever created these EBEs might evolutionarily speaking be so advanced that they can manipulate or have access to this quantum consciousness on a level that is simply unattainable to humans. Perhaps they have access to bilocation, precognition, telepathy, all these things that would exist in this field, all these things that would be made available to you 
if you had access to this field. The more complex that we grow, the more we attract this field, the more we attract this field, the more complex we grow, and so on and so forth, until we reach this apotheosis, this critical mass. It seems like these EBOs have been engineered for this task specifically. So if I was on a separate planet, you know, playing the equivalent of a game of billiards, uh, you know, uh, running the world, having billions of uh, my currency, and perhaps I would create one of these beings uh, that would seed a planet for scientific purposes in order to help accelerate or study this apotheosis. And perhaps this apotheosis has already happened, and their function is to harness that or to give themselves some type of immortality. We've already gone way past speculating at this point, okay? But I am so fascinated by this theory of this hypothesis. It makes a lot of sense that you would create a race of worker bees and perhaps thousands of Earth-like planets in order to find the answer. Let's say you've been around for hundreds of millions of years, right? And you're looking to find the answer. Well, one of the ways to find the answer is to become the answer, is to become quantum consciousness and create this, you know, event, this critical mass event where you become the universe or whatever. I don't know. It just seems to me uh, to fill a lot of these holes. Let me know your thoughts. I might have, I might have stepped out of line there. It says here, the author of the document added his reflections and interpretations as an appendix. Okay. He specified that for them, the soul field is not a belief, but an obvious truth. He also argues that the soul loses its individuality after death. So two things there. The soul is not a belief. It's just an absolute truth. Okay. And perhaps again, you know, this leads us back to the container comment uh, from Bob Lazar. Soul loses its individuality after death, but that memory and experience persist as a part of the field. So, although after death, our body dies, our soul retains that information and perhaps expands it into the quantum field, enriching it somehow. Maybe that's the whole point of life, is just to learn lessons and to help, you know, enrich this soul machine. This fact would influence the philosophy and culture of EBOs, resulting in a society that doesn't fear death, but which places no importance or reverence on individuality. Maybe the reason they all wear the same little suits. The belief compels them to seed life, shape it, and nurture it. Again, what I was saying with planets, you know, if you could bounce around the universe so freely, why wouldn't you have 100,000 planets at different stages of evolution that you sort of, you know, help? help control. It compels them to seed life, shape it, nurture it, monitor it, and influence it for the ultimate purpose of creating this apotheosis. Paradoxically, they have little or no respect for an individual's well-being, or like the 4chan whistleblower said, they simply don't care. Please be advised that I'm speaking from memory of something I read more than 10 years ago, so take the following with a grain of salt. Also, I'm not a philosopher or an artist, so please excuse my struggle to properly formulate the concepts and my dry terminology. Finally, note that this information comes from a document whose author was directly contacted, uh, directly interacting with an EBO. It is not specified whether it was an ambassador, a crash survivor, a prisoner. The means of communication were not specified either. Question four, what the F he dropped the location of the lab? Answer, Battelle National Biodefense Institute. It's on Google Map. This was one of the longer documents that we've sat through. And for me, possibly one of the most paradigm shifting documents, if real. The physical anatomy of the creature seemed to align with a lot of UFO lore which tells us that either the original poster of this was familiar with lore, but was also a credible microbiologist, which is absolutely possible, by the way. You know, what a beautiful LARP to be someone who's knowledgeable on 
you know, who has a doctorate in microbiology. You'd have to, I mean, this is, this is the real, this is the real thing here. You'd have to have three things. That's to be a combination of you want to prank the world. You have an absolute obsession with UFOs and you are absolutely obsessed with microbiology. Those three things have to come together for this to be a LARP, right? Which is totally possible. I'm not going to rule that out. He doesn't overprove why he's doing this. Like the 4chan guy, 4chan guy's like, I got, I have cancer, this and that. And he was like, and maybe that was a red herring too, because a lot of people said about the 4chan guy that like, that would make you so easy to find. And that's a perfect red herring then, you know. Uh, but this person makes up for the lack of technical jargon that the former whistleblower had given us. Uh, just so many words that I've learned today. And it's clear to me that this person does study this stuff. Maybe not the EBOs, but definitely microbiology. But, you know, beyond all of these things, the biggest takeaways for me were the secretion, their, their digestive sort of uh, how they digest things and secrete it through their skin, their lack of vocal cords and the size of their brain, the ammonia that is secreted through their pores, their musculature, and then finally, potentially, their philosophy, their thoughts on this potential apotheosis. A lot to think about, folks. And I'm glad we read through it. That is definitely something. It's it's one of those things I'm just going to like end up sitting in silence for like an hour after this and just staring at a wall. There's a lot for me to unpack here. And I'm sure there's a lot for you, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. Your detailed thoughts, not just your like, oh, it was cool. I believe him. Give me like, give me some deep stuff, dude. I want to read some cool stuff and do so in the comments, but also do so in the Discord. Join us on Discord. Check out the Patreon if you want more of this content. We're uploading weekly extra episodes just for you guys uh, that you'll have access to. So if you're a fan of this channel, and you want to support it. It's half a cup of Starbucks coffee, uh, you know, that pays for an entire library of content. So. I'll spend hours editing this, hours filming this, putting it up for free, and somehow, you know, someone will still call me a grifter for wanting to uh, ask for support, you know, to make this a living. But is what it is. I appreciate you, and I appreciate those of you who do support this channel actively. Uh, you're very, very much appreciated. Thank you for everything, guys. I gotta go edit this stuff. It's gonna take me forever. I appreciate. It. We'll see you on the next video. Big investigation coming very, very soon. I am almost done with that edit as well. We're going to be taking a look at Chris Bledsoe. Stay tuned for that. We'll see you. Peace.